We're uh, in the fourth section, I believe, as we divided up the chapter, where the betrayal in this section is the betrayal of the nation of Israel itself, uh, not just Judas and, um, and not just portray, uh, betrayed of all um, as, as the apostles betrayed him, um, but uh, it's the betrayal of the, uh, of the whole nation, and they, they're doing that in the sense that the leadership of the nation speaks for the nation. And uh, the Lord Jesus Christ has been arrested from the garden, taken uh, before Annas and then Caiaphas. We were looking at, uh, only in John, do you realize there's two different places he was interrogated. And, uh, and then Luke will give us some information at the close of our study today that will tell us how long that interrogation went on. But the, uh, the Lord has been uh, arrested, brought before both of those chief priests. And, uh, and as we looked at this, we saw that Peter was a witness to this betrayal of the leadership and the nation in the, in, in the fact that he was a witness to the interrogation just a little bit outside of that. Uh, and then there was the false witnesses <laughs> that stepped forward, and a whole bunch of them apparently stepped forward, but not, nobody agreed, and the two people that agreed on one situation didn't agree about the situation, so they really didn't have a false witness, uh, and yet uh, we're at the point where the chief priest now is going to um, uh, bring his accusation, and, uh, and then the Lord's going to respond on that. In, in Mark chapter 14, verse 60, it says, And the high priest stood up, in the midst, and asked Jesus, saying, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? But he held his peace, and answered nothing. Again the high priest asked him, and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Now, I just stop there, because uh, at first I want to concentrate on the high priest, but it, really this section, beginning in verse 60 and down to 65, is the Lord's response to the accusations against him. And, and the high priest is calling for, for his response. Uh, and, and really, when you look at that, if, like in verse 59, you got these witnesses, and finally there's two that agree on one particular uh, statement he made. But verse 59 says, but neither so did their witnesses agree together. And then verse 60 says, And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Answerest thou nothing? Well, he's bluffing. <laughs> what would the Lord have to answer about? If no one brought an accusation that could be two people could testify to, is there any reason to answer for anything? And, uh, and, and when the Lord stays silent there, he stays silent because there's nothing to answer. Uh, but at the same time, when the, when the chief priest stands up and says, what is it? Answerest thou nothing? He's bluffing as if he can intimidate the Lord into saying something that's going to get him in trouble because there's, he knows that he has nothing against the Lord. Uh, <laughs> you can just see the, we called it a kangaroo court last week, and that's exactly what it is. And you know, lawyers and police, they do all that. You know, you watch all these TV shows and cops and, and especially all the ones that they show uh, uh, someone arrested and put on trial. You, you ever see those programs? And the first half of the program, you, you, the person's guilty. The second half, they do the defense and, oh, no, he's innocent. <laughs> and then you wait to find out what the jury decided. But uh, you learn that the lawyers a lot of time or the police in interrogating will throw out bluffs to see if they get the person, you know, we got witnesses and so forth. But they, when I read that, that's what I realized, first of all, the Lord had nothing to answer. Then I realized the chief priest, if I knew that, the chief priest knew that. And so he, he's bluffing to try to uh, make it look like, oh, man, we got all this witness against thee. And, you know, you, what, you better start answering for all these accusations. Now, when the Lord doesn't answer the accusations, he's actually fulfilling. And go back to Isaiah 53. He's fulfilling prophecy. It, 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 this whole passage is about the Lord and will take you right to the crucifixion. I'll just start up in verse 4. It says, Surely he, he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed, we esteem, uh, but, we, but we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. So they looked at him as if he was guilty of something. But he was wounded, so contrary to that, he was wounded for our transgressions. 
He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and, we, uh, uh, and he was afflicted, yet opened not he his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the shearers, and as a lamb before his shearers is dumb, so opened he not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And that's what we're going to see in, in these movements. And who shall declare his generation? For he, he was cut off from the land of the living. He's not going to, as if he's not going to have any future. Because that's what it looked like until he raises. Uh, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And, and you can you know, continue reading on. It's so obvious uh, that this is about the rest, the... Uh, the trial, the crucifixion, the purpose of the crucifixion even. And, and when you read on, you'll get to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That w when people talk about witnessing to, to Jewish people, um, someone here was telling me, and Pastor Jordan said it this week, I didn't write him down. But they were talking to a Jewish person who they were trying to figure out how to witness to him because this Jewish person only goes by the Torah. Uh, if I remember everything right, the Torah is only the law. Uh, but there's, they divided the, the Old Testament into three parts, but all of the Old Testament is accepted in the canon of Scripture of the Jewish Bible. So that uh, the prophetic section, uh, a Jew does recognize as being the Word of God. And Isaiah 53 would show a Jewish person who their Messiah is and what his Messiah accomplished. And so Isaiah 53 is, is a... Uh, a good passage to use when witnessing to Jewish people who haven't recognized Jesus Christ as their Messiah. They're, they're just so much in here, just in this one chapter, let alone all the prophecies of the Old Testament to, that should show clearly <laughs> to, to anyone who's open for, for uh, the truth, um, the reality of Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of these passages. But it's verse 7, Isaiah 53, 7, that as the Lord's being interrogated and they ask him for a witness, you know, how is he going to answer all these witnesses? And he doesn't answer. He's fulfilling that verse. Uh, but go back to Mark 14. Now, you know, you realize that the Lord, he's going to give himself a ransom for many, as the Bible says. When, when the priest asked him, answerest thou nothing, not only was he fulfilling the scripture, not only did he not have to answer, but just think if he did. If the Lord who knows the law and knows all the people who are lying and what they're doing and slanting the truth, if he would have defended himself, wouldn't he have been free? I mean, even, even I, I, you know, you, there's no ifs. Everything happened the way God knew it was going to happen. But the, but the Lord, if he would have defended himself, he could have defended himself adequately that there could have been no crucifixion. He, he, could, have, he could have told what every false witness against him, what was false about it. And, and then there would have been no accusation to answer against him. And, and he could have defended himself according to the law, used scripture to do so, to make the priest look like, you better not go any further. You're going, to be a, you're going to be not recognized as truthful in front of the people. He would have been off. But, but the Lord kept his mouth shut, not only just for not fulfilling the prophecy, but because he was giving himself. He was going to, he's going to be crucified as a criminal, uh, but they can't find anything against him. And actually, when you look at the second part, the Lord's going to help the high priest. It says uh, in verse 60, 61 again of Mark 14, but he, but he held his peace and answered nothing. Again, the high priest answered, asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Uh, the other gospel writers say the Son of God. And, and now the Lord is finally going to speak, verse 62. And Jesus, uh, Jesus said, I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sit, sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. So, you know, the, the, well, let me just, verse 63, it says, Then the high priest rent his clothes and said, What need we any further witness? <laughs> so we don't have a witness that agrees, but now we don't need them because he just said that he's the Son of God and, and now we can, we can have him crucified for blasphemy. 
and uh, except the problem was he really is the son of God. Uh, so the, the witness against him is a true witness, so it's not even a false witness that they can accuse him of any kind of wrongdoing. But anyhow, the Lord finally helped him out in doing that, and, uh, uh, and, and then they're going to use his words against him. You know, I, 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 probably in the last year, I've shared a passage of Scripture in other occasions. I don't even know what, maybe they were in Mark, maybe they were in Acts, wherever they were. But it's a passage in Proverbs that, that sounds contradictory, and I always laughed about it, because you understand how a, a critic could say it's a contradiction, and yet at the same time, anybody who reads it realizes it's not a contradiction. But in reading this passage, I finally realized that the Lord Jesus Christ is a life application of the passage. I'll show you what I mean. Uh, Proverbs 26. Uh, I never saw this before. I, I saw the verses before. I never saw the Lord as being a life application of it. Before you find it, anybody know what I'm talking about? <coughs> Proverbs 26. <laughs> I'll wait till you all get there because they're short verses and you have to think about them, so I want you to see them. Okay, Proverbs 26, verse 5. says, Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. Oh, well, i got to start with verse 4. <laughs> verse 4. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. Now wait a minute, do you answer him or you don't answer him? <laughs> Isn't that two contradictory verses? Don't answer him, answer him. Well, you, you understand that with, if, without even talking about the passage we're looking at in Mark, you understand that, that the point is you can't answer a fool. You're never going to win, he's a fool. So if you, if you answer him, then you're just, you're just getting involved in his foolishness. And if you don't answer him, you're letting him get away with his foolishness. You're not going to win. That's the point. And it's true about the Lord. He didn't win, did he? But he did both of those. And I, I go, oh, wow, he did verse 4. Answer not a fool. Answer thou me. Listen to all these accusations. What sayest thou? The Lord said nothing. He, he didn't answer the fool. <laughs> and that's what the Caiaphas is a fool there, yeah, lest the Lord be like unto him. Then Caiaphas asked the second time, and the second time the Lord does answer him. Yeah, and certainly that last part of uh, uh, verse 5, lest he be wise in his own conceit. <laughs> you think Caiaphas thought too much of himself? Tell me if you think you're the son of God. And he's talking to the son of God. He's just the appointed high priest of the nation of Israel who's compromising with Rome, who's going against the law of God, who already put a death sentence against Jesus Christ and now is trying to find a reason to put him to death. That, that man's got a problem. And boy, I looked at that and I said, hey, I don't have a note in my Bible, but I got to do that before I forget that. You know, I teach something like this next week, I'll forget it myself. But, uh, but boy, there's a life application to those two verses, as the Lord Jesus Christ did both. And uh, so, anyhow, go back to Mark 14. That verse, uh, verse after, the, after he asked him, Art thou the Christ? Now, remember, Christ is the Messiah, the one that was promised in the Old Testament that's going to come, the Son of the Blessed. And to be called the Son of the Blessed, to be called the Son of God, is an understanding of deity. Um, I, I believe we got some verses that we're going to look at that, that's going to show you that, so I'll, I'll, I'll hold off on that for now. But sometimes we think like son of God means something other than God. But that's not how it was ever thought in the Jewish mind. Think about it this way. Rather than saying like Kevin is my son, so therefore he's not really me. But because Kevin's my son, we're both humans. God came forth as a man. To call Jesus Christ the Son of God call, is to call him divine. He is one with the Father. And we know through the virgin birth, he is actually God in the flesh, not just an offspring of God, but he is actually God in the flesh. So, but Son of God, son of God when, uh, 
the Son of God, when, when that is used, the Jewish mind understands that you're saying you're deity. Um, anyway, I, 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 I'll hold off on that because we'll come back to that. Verse, 50, uh, verse 62, when he said that, Jesus said, what did he say? I am. I am. Now, you and I, hopefully, and if you don't, you need to know that I am is not just a phrase in the Bible, especially when used by the Lord, of personal identification. That when we read that in the English, we think of that as personal identification. But when Moses asked God, when I go to the nation of Israel and they say, who sent you to tell us that you're, you're going to deliver us from e Egypt? Who do I say sent me? And the, and the Jehovah God said, I am. Tell them, I am that I am sent you. And that is a, the, it, it's a phrase, I am is one who always existed. The self-existing one. Um, the, the eternal God. It, it's a phrase that that means. We've already seen, so we don't need to go back there, that when they first came to arrest the Lord, and he says, whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am he. They all fell down because of the power of what that name means. I'm surprised that Caiaphas didn't just fall over when he said that. But uh, God didn't chose to strike him with the power of that, that response. But when the Lord, when Jesus said, I am, that you go back to, thou art the Christ, the son of the blessed, I am. Yes, that's who the Christ is. He's the I am that's come in the flesh. Jesus said, I am. And, and then he adds to that. So he gave a, you know, you know, tell us clearly, well, two words, I am, <laughs> straight confession. But then he adds to that. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. So not only does he identify himself, but he identifies himself with the acts that the Son of Man is going to do, that the Messiah is promised to do, how he is going to sit at the right hand of power. Now he's talking to Caiaphas, who is wise in his own conceits, thinking that he's the power. <laughs> Boy, he, he's going to see, after the Lord's telling him, and you're going to see that I am, because you're going to see that I'm at the right hand of God in power, and then you're going to see me coming back in judgment. And, uh, and, and that, those are things that the, the Messiah was promised to do. And so the Lord Jesus Christ is identifying that. Now, when he says, when he, when he says, uh, ye shall see, uh, Mark says it just in verse, uh, I got to look at that again. In Mark 62, Jesus said, I am, and ye shall see. The book of Matthew, in that very same interrogation, when the Lord says, I am, it says, the Lord said, and hereafter ye shall see. And Mark didn't add the word hereafter, and, and I don't think I needed to add it for your understanding because it is going to be after the death, after the burial, after the resurrection, even after the ascension of the Lord, that those prophecies are going to be fulfilled. So it's not going to be right here in the presence of, of Caiaphas that he's going to see Jesus Christ at the right hand of power. It's going to be after these events, after he's crucified, after Caiaphas has his way, that Jesus Christ is going to have his day called the day of the Lord. And, uh, and so it's a prophecy that, that ought to, if the I am shouldn't have struck fear in him, the rest of that statement should have knocked him over. Uh, because, well, it's not only the truth, but the reality, and if Caiaphas has any understanding of Scripture, and realize he's on the wrong side of the one in power who's coming back in judgment, well, it, it should have been enough to scare him right to his grave right at that point. Uh, so it's going to be a hereafter, and sure enough, it is hereafter. Come over to Acts chapter 2. We don't go to the Old Testament for these prophecies, but that's exactly as Peter picks up the ministry after the Lord's death, burial, resurrection, and ascension that Peter begins to prophesy about. Peter warning the nation of Israel about their rejection of Christ and, and how God raised them from the dead. It says, in, I'll just miss all that and go right down to verse 32. This Jesus hath God raised up whereof we are witnesses. Therefore being at the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which ye now see and hear. 
So they've already seen the Holy Spirit poured out on Peter and the rest of the believing remnant that were there, uh, certainly uh, the apostles that are speaking with tongues. It says, for this is not, th th for David is not ascended into heavens, into the heavens, but he himself, uh, but he said himself, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And, you know, when you study those names, Christ is a Messiah. He's going to be a Savior. But he's also Lord and Christ. To those who have not acknowledged Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah, as the Savior, they're going to, they're going to realize he's coming back as Lord. And he's going to, on the day of the Lord, bring judgment. So Peter's warning them he is both Lord and Christ. And he's, in, in those two different uh, positions, he's going to either judge or save in, at his second coming. But he is at that right hand of power. And, and as, as the Lord said, hereafter you're going to see the Son of Man sitting on uh, the, the right hand of the Father. Um, yeah, there's another verse in Matthew I want to show you, but... And then the second is coming in the clouds. Come over to Acts chapter 7. So they were going to see him sitting. And by the way, that, when we read that passage, that's where Peter said he was doing sitting. But then after he sits, then he comes back with, uh, in the clouds of heaven. And in Acts chapter 7, verse 55... This is where, this is really, I would relate Acts 7 very closely to the passage in Mark 14 where the leaders of Israel are speaking for the nation as their rejection against Jesus Christ. Acts 7 is the leaders of Israel speaking for the nation of the rejection of the Holy Spirit. But when they do that, it says, Stephen, that, they're, that was testifying to the truth, that they're, they're going to kill him now. It says, but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand, on the right hand of God and saying, Behold, I see heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And they, cry, and they cried with a loud voice and stopped their ear and ran upon him with one accord. Now I'm, gonna, I'm reading on for a reason here. And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeling down cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not their sin to their, this sin to their charge. And when he said this, he fell asleep. The Lord started to come back. That's why he sits down on the power, right hand of power, and now it's time to come back, come in the clouds of heaven to, in judgment. And he stands up to come, but he does not come, and that, that person that, by the name of Saul, God interrupts Israel's program here, and, and for 2,000 years has turned to us Gentiles in grace, rather than judge the world. But what the Lord said, almost, the first part of him sitting at the right hand of power has taken place, Coming almost started, but it was prevented by the age of grace, but will be fulfilled in the second coming. Now go to Matthew 24, just like the Lord said it would. <coughs> 24 and verse 30, it says... Uh, This is after the tribulation, uh, in fact, verse 29 is immediately after the tribulation of those days. The sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Just like he said, that's going to happen. Uh, there is something just in my mind, so I might as well say it to you. Just I don't have an answer for it yet. But the Lord said to those, those, that chief priest, hereafter you're going to see this. I, I, when did he see Jesus Christ sitting at the hand of power? And, and when it says every eye shall see him, well, Caiaphas is dead. <laughs> he, he's not going to see him at the second coming. 
I know that the final conclusion is the final thing I want to sum up when I get to this passage, and that is he's going to see the Lord Jesus Christ in a great white throne judgment someday, and he's going to be sitting in power, but he has already come in the clouds with power and great glory. So, but anyhow, the personal application to it, but the fulfillment of the prophecy uh, is going to happen just like the Lord said, after they crucify him, he is going to prove who he is. Now, you know, in Mark 14, just hold everywhere, just hold where you're at right there. Uh, Caiaphas said to him, um, or the Lord's answer to Caiaphas was, Jesus said, I am, and ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the, uh, at the right, on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. The Lord Jesus Christ, we said this before, and it's important to say it again now, because he asked them, art thou the Son of the Blessed, the Son of God? And he says, I am, and you're going to see the Son of Man. There's a difference between the title Son of God and the title Son of Man. Son of Man is a title of the rightful heir to the earthly throne. The one who has the right to rule this earth. Look at Daniel chapter 7. It's the Lord's favorite title to himself. Every time he talks about himself in the Gospels, he keeps calling himself the Son of Man. And that should trigger anyone to go back to Daniel chapter 7 and the things said about the Messiah. And I, I understand what that title means. Now there's some prophets that were called Son of Man, but that's in the sense that they are going to speak for God, and whether it's a reference to their humanity, I'm not sure, but uh, it, it's certainly a reference to someone who's going to speak in the place of God. But Jesus Christ is God who's going to reign. In, in this vision in Daniel 7, verse 13, it says, And I saw in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given unto him dominion and glory and a kingdom, and all people, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. In his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. Now, when he says, I'm the son of man, and you'll see me in power, and coming in the clouds of heaven, that's the prophecy they're going to see. He is this one who's going to reign over the earth that the, that the prophets spoke about. That's him. When he said, I am, that's him. And, and uh, that's going to be fulfilled. Um, so back in Mark chapter 14, let's, let's see if we can't get the verdict against him here. So that's, the Lord uses all those phrases that the priest should have understood. But instead, verse 63 says, Then the high priest rent his clothes and said, What need we any further witness? We have heard the blasphemy, what think ye? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. So, when, so he, you know, the high priest says, Okay, now he's got himself, he's, gonna, he, he, he's uh, witnessed himself, he, he's spoke blasphemy himself, now they can have him killed. But uh, if he spoke the truth, that's not blasphemy, right? They haven't proved he's not that, the Son of Man. And, and they're consider, con, con, uh, con accusing him of blasphemy. I don't know if you know, but maybe more in the last days, when I, the last decade, probably because of the television ministry and all, that the liberal churches that never do talk about the second coming of Christ, their congregations now... You know, whether it be, you know, I'll let you figure out who they are. But it used to be like they never would talk about Christ coming back. You know, like there is no such thing to them as a rapture because they don't even know who the body of Christ is. But they really don't look for Jesus Christ to return to earth. They don't live with an anticipation of him coming back because they're liberal. They don't really believe the Bible. Well, you know, if the Lord really isn't going to come back in power and great glory like the passage says... And, and that really isn't a truth that, that to be looking forward to, then those people think just like Caiaphas. And not only do they think like Caiaphas, if, if what they believe, that they, they really don't look like, you know, like Revelation, that, that's not ever going to really happen. It's really happened in the past as history. Well, if that was really true, and that was their philosophy, then Jesus Christ is guilty of death. Because he said he's coming back. 
And if, it's, if that's really not going to happen that way, the way the prophet said, then Jesus Christ is a liar. He did blaspheme. And Caiaphas is the righteous one. And Jesus Christ deserves to be crucified. And that's how Jesus Christ is presented in a lot of churches. And it's amazing that people don't see <laughs> they're on the wrong side here. Uh, but when it says there, and they all agreed, consented, to be, that he's guilty of death, when it talks about uh, they all agreeing on that, all goes all the way back to verse 53. And they, led, uh, and they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests and elders and scribes. It's the full leadership of the nation of Israel. Agree with the high priest. It's not just your decision. It's our decision. And they speak for the nation as the leaders where they condemn Jesus Christ to death. Um, I didn't get to where I thought I was going to get to. So, uh, But anyhow, it, it, does, it does end us at an important part. The, the, the verdict now is he's guilty of death. But there's really some little side thing that's said in verses 64 and 65 concerning uh, after they're all convinced that he's guilty of death, now they feel free to mock him and they begin that mockery. There, there's some things we need to look at that. At, and, and then that, that, that'll be a good lead into the finishing up of the chapter with Peter's three denials of Christ. Um, anyhow, real interesting detail there. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we thank you for your Son, who as we look at the passage, not only do we realize really who he is and really have more to see about that even next week, but, but we see his willingness to give himself, not to defend himself, so that even though he was innocent of all charges, he could take upon himself our sins and become our Savior. We thank you, Father, for even the life application of how to deal with the foolishness of the world. And uh, so we thank you for the things that we learned today and keep them in our minds and as a means of rejoicing and glorifying your Son. It's in his name we pray. Amen.